Hi, my name is Jason Chanko. I'm the Applications Marketing Manager for Siglent Technologies North America, and I'm visiting our friends here at Salig today to introduce two new products. The Siglent SDS-1204X-E, that's a four-channel oscilloscope, uh, two A to B converters, uh, 100 megahertz or 200 megahertz analog bandwidth, uh, it has a uh, 100 giga sample per second sample rate, and because it has two A to D converters, that one giga sample per second is actually distributed amongst the two, in two input channel banks. So we've got bank one with channel one, channel two, which can sample up to one giga sample per second divided by those two channels. And the same for bank two, which is uh, channel three and channel four, which are indicated here. Um, we're also introducing the SDG 6000 series of arbitrary waveform generators. This particular series uh, comes in 200, 350, and 500 megahertz analog bandwidth models and is capable of 2.4 giga samples per second on the arbitrary waveform generator output. Um, just going to play around, there'll probably be a lot of ums, uh, play around a little bit with some of the capabilities of these new scopes. So again, uh, with the SDS-1204X-E, this particular scope, again, we've got that four input channels. Some of the really nice features, because of the new digital platform, this is using the Xilinx Zinc processor, which has a math coprocessor. That enables the instrument to calculate and crunch numbers very quickly. And what does that mean to the user? Uh, it means the user interface is going to be very fast. As we make adjustments or turn on measurements, they're all going to be happening very quickly. Here we've got it set to FFT. Uh, which is another advantage of this particular box. It's got a million point FFT, which it gives you very high resolution in the frequency domain when you're using the time base uh, here on the top to calculate the frequencies down below. So showing a very similar to a spectrum analyzer or real-time spectrum analysis, uh, it, we're delivering this or calculating the frequency-based information off of that time-based uh, time-based input. So in this case here, we're just doing a sine wave into the uh, into the instrument. What I'd like to do is just shift that over to the square wave. I'm just going to go to waveforms, uh, go to square. Now the SDG 6000 is going to bounce between the two. SDG 6000, like the SDG 2000 X series, has a touch screen, so we can actually just select right on the front panel. If we want to switch through particular uh, applications, we can just press the actual waveform itself and select it that way. So we can go to pulse, we can go to square, we can go to sign, uh, or we can go from the front panel button here on waveforms. It's just a little bit of an easier way to get there. Uh, we're going to go back to square so we have a lot more harmonic content, and we'll just put this at 50 meg, uh, 50 megahertz. Another way that we could enter that from the front panel, we could press, oh, I went over here, if I go back, fill, so we can put in the 50, uh, we can adjust the value here, or we could type in 50 and we can select the units. So we'll just go to 50 megahertz, and here we can see the 50 megahertz square wave here, and down here we can see the harmonics. Uh, when we go back into the math function, we can change the window types, uh, the source, and we can also turn on cursors, and we can put the cursors on the math function, and so now they're going to be down below, oops, fat fingers, and so now you can see we have cursors that are going to read out the actual position here, uh, which is 98 meg, wait, it's 50 meg, 49.75 uh, based on the resolution we have here. I'll press that key in again. Now we can adjust the second cursor and make a delta measurement as well on that math or uh, FFT calculation. Some of the other features that we have, I'm just going to turn off that FFT operator by double pressing the math key and now we're back to the uh, square wave. We can also do some automated measurements. I'm going to turn off the FFT. We're just going to go up here to, um, oops, sorry, don't want to go to math. I actually wanted to go to measure. And so we can go channel one, uh, we can select different channel types if we had them activated, and then we can go over here to our automatic measurement type selection, and we can use the uh, arrow or the knob here to select the different types. So we could go to amplitude or maximum minimum voltage values all the way. Uh, we can, if we had a second channel enabled, we'd be able to do channel delay. So things like measuring phase or rise time difference uh, between different channels. Let's get back out of that um, measure. So uh, we can also enable cursors on the main screen here. Uh, some other things that we have available. I'm going to turn on modulation uh, and show you some of the uh, different persistence capabilities we have on this particular scope that have uh, very nice features for the, the display of the information. So I'm going to turn on the color gradient. And the color gradient for our oscilloscopes is going to show us uh, we've got the persistence set to infinite 
So what, what happens on the digital display, every time a pixel is illuminated, which means a signal has occurred in that particular, that particular pixel value, it's going to hold that value forever. Because we have the color grade on, any time there is no more signal present, it turns into that purple color. Uh, I'm just going to go back to the sine wave, and then we're going to turn on modulation, and we'll just do an AM mod, uh, and I'm going to clear that persistence for a second. So now we're just doing... I'm going to adjust that trigger value. I'll clear the persistence one more time. And now you can see, I'm going to slow down that AM frequency so that it takes a little bit more time. It sweeps a little bit more. We'll go to 1 hertz. And now you'll see that we're actually modulating the amplitude at a 1 hertz repetition rate. And because of that color persistence, uh, the color gradient, we're seeing the events that happen most frequently in a, in a time period are going to be colored with a more... Uh, uh, it's going to be a, a hotter color, uh, so it's going to be a red, and the things that happen less frequently are going to be a lighter blue color or cooler color, so heat, hot and cold color types denote how the frequency of the events. Uh, and again, we can go back and we can clear that, uh, clear the persistence and start over. Um, actually, most of the time, you don't necessarily need it to be infinite, but uh, one second, still gonna... Hmm. A little bit longer. Anyway, I wonder what's happening. Um, so, some other capabilities on this. I'm going to go back. Oh, so the color gradient can be helpful uh, in a normal mode. You can see here we've got the events occurring. Uh, if we had a glitch, for example, this may not indicate it as clearly as something like that. A glitch would show up as a blue, a light blue line, and we could hold it on that display, and it, its color is going to offset it even more, so it's going to be more visible to the, uh, to the user. So you'd be able to find troubles uh, more quickly in that case. Uh, this scope also has, and this will be an aside, I haven't used the, the waves, waveform search feature yet, but that's something I would like to show at some point. Um, it uses our history mode. History mode allows trigger events to be stacked sequentially, so you would have a trigger event, a trigger event, a trigger event, a trigger event. It stores all of those in memory sequentially, and then you can roll through those frames of data sequentially and it, with a navigation uh, and search feature, you can actually determine what faults you would be looking for. So you can set a window of voltage values between a start and a stop and a distance, so, sort of like a run trigger, and then isolate the frames that had that particular value. So it's, it's almost like you're applying a secondary search trigger to a, an initially captured group of images uh, that were captured using a, another type of trigger, for example. So it's really just, using another trigger, two triggers stacked against each other on the same set of data to isolate even more faults. Um, and that's that navigation feature. Unfortunately, I, I haven't played with it, so it would be tough to show too much of it right now. Um, but that is the idea. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's actually the search. Oh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna play with it because I could get, I'd get lost for, for a while. Okay, so it's showing us event numbers. I'm gonna turn search off so we don't get too far away from what we were doing. Um, the history function, again, is just capturing, if you imagine each screen of data is a frame, so a similar to a frame from a movie or a picture, every time we have a trigger event, we're actually stacking those frames on each other. When we set persistence, what we're doing is we're saying we're never going to take that frame of data off the display, and then we're going to stack a new trigger event and a new frame on top of it very much like taking transparencies and stacking them on top of each other, the digital display is doing that exact same thing. When we say we want to hold that persistence forever, that means we're never going to change those images. Um, generally speaking, you're gonna have the persistence set to something like a few seconds, 10, three, four, five seconds. And that means that that frame of data is gonna stay on the display for three to five seconds, whatever you have the persistence set to, and then it's going to go away in a first in, first out sort of stack. Uh, history mode, instead of stacking them all, in the, uh, on the display vertically, let's say, or in the Z direction, it stacks them in memory sequentially and then it plays through each of them. So if we enable history mode, you'll see we have a frame number. Frame number can be anywhere from uh, one to the maximum value, which I think is it's 80,000 for this particular scope. But we can actually go backwards in time and replay all of those. And now you'll notice that we're going backwards through all of those frames. So we, each time the trigger event has occurred, the scope stores that information as a bitmap image. Um, 
well, a binary equivalent. Well, that is a bitmap image. So it's storing it as a bitmap image, and now it's just replaying them in, in time, and we can stop and pause that at any point in time. We can turn cursor, oh, I'm sorry. We can turn cursors on, we can make measurements on that particular frame. So what you could do is configure the oscilloscope in such a way to collect data over a series of time periods or a series of trigger events and then replay each of those events uh, and then be able to isolate what problem we're actually looking for uh, and make measurements on that at a particular point in time.